um, and I'm the other Scott. Uh, I'm about two months short of having been here as senior pastor eight years. Um, my wife Debbie and I were here for five years from about uh, 91 to 96, although on staff just four years from 92 to 96. Uh, I was the college minister during those years. Um, and uh, while I was in seminary, uh, I too brought, I was at Fuller and did a couple of degrees at, at Fuller Seminary. Uh, and then uh, we went to Oklahoma. I taught at one of our schools in Oklahoma for seven years and was pulpit supplying at a church just outside of Dallas, uh, Richardson, Texas, over the summer. And it was a wonderful summer. And by the end of the summer, they said, hey, we keep interviewing people, but the more we interview people, the more we really like your preaching and we like your family even better than we like you. And would it be possible for, for you to consider staying? And so uh, each Sunday that I was preaching there, I just felt more and more connected to that church and to those people and, and excited to get to preach every week. And so uh, we said, yeah, I think we're ready to do that. And so we were in, in Richardson, uh, Texas for, for about four and a half years. And uh, Scott and Julie and I, we've known each other for a long, long time, but that was the first opportunity that Scott and I had to, to work together there the last couple of years in Dallas. Um, and then when, I, when Paz Naz called, and uh, this had been such a wonderful church to us while we were in seminary, uh, we felt so drawn. And Deb, Deb grew up in Southern California, so in some ways this is coming home for her. Uh, we just, <laughs> as we were talking to him, and they said, you know, we really feel like this is the Lord's direction. I said, that's great, but if you're going to get one, Scott, you're probably going to get two. Are you okay with that? And so after about six months, Scott and Julie came and joined, and, um, and it's just been a, a really, really wonderful eight years. Uh, God has really blessed it. Uh, the church has continued to grow, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about, about the vision for us locally uh, but Deb and I have four children. Uh, our oldest, Caleb, is a sophomore at Point Loma uh, with uh, Darwin's son, Casey, uh, and just doing really, really well there. Uh, our second son, Noah, you will probably you may see him from time to time when the youth lead worship. He usually is on a guitar, and he's outgrown me now. He's uh, about 6'4", on his way to 6'5", I'm afraid. Uh, just keeps outgrowing his clothes. Uh, but he and my wife are on a college tour this week. Uh, he went to visit Point Loma last week, and he went. To, he and Debbie are in Nashville today. Uh, they're visiting one of our other Nazarene colleges, Trevecca Nazarene. Uh, and then he's going to visit some some school called the Zeus Pacific next week. And then my alma mater, I graduated from Northwest Nazarene College, which is up in Idaho. And they, they called, and uh, they're going to fly Noah up in a few weeks. So he's down to four schools, three Nazarenes and another one. Um, but he... Uh, they're, they're on that college tour. And then Jonah is a freshman in high school. And then we, have a, we finally got it right and had a little girl at the end. Um, and uh, we have a little girl who's a, not very little anymore, sixth grader, uh, Sophie. Uh, but they're, they're wonderful. And, and this church has been uh, nothing but uh, loving to them. You know, as a pastor, and I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. Everybody in my family are ministers. You've probably heard me tell some of that story. Both my grandfather's were Nazarene ministers. All my aunts and uncles were. Um, my sister and brother-in-law, Pastor Seattle First Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> Most of my cousins, I have two cousins who aren't in ministry, um, and they support the rest of us. But, uh, and I have, I have one cousin who escaped to the Methodist, because uh, their, their, their retirement plan's a lot better than ours. But, uh, uh, but the rest of us, this is kind of the only marketable skills that we have as a family. Uh, but but, you know, when you grow up as a pastor's kid, you, you kind of live in the fishbowl, right? Uh, everybody kind of knows who you are, and, and sometimes you feel like uh, you want to kind of run from that spotlight. Uh, but this church has been nothing but uh, loving and embracing to our kids uh, from the very first Sunday that we were here. I, I love, every once in a while I see the pictures of our first Sunday here, and I can't believe how little our kids were. Um, but Jonah and Sophie, when we first got here, they just took off. And, and if you've explored this campus, you know, it's, these four buildings are all connected to each other underground. And they're, underneath the patio here is a big storage area. There are just thousands of places to hide on this campus. It's the best hide-and-go-seek spot in the universe. And so Jonah and Sophie had met some other kids, and they were all playing hide-and-go-seek throughout the, the facility. And about halfway through the morning, Jonah came, came running up to me on the patio with his arms spread out. He goes, Dad, your church is amazing. And I said, well, it's not my church yet. But, uh, they, uh, but from that first Sunday on, the church has just been so wonderful to our kids. And uh, they not only love Christ, um, but thankfully, they love the church and, uh, and have found a home here, too. 
So I'm glad that you are beginning to find a home among us as well. Again, this morning, the, the, the two things I want to do, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Church of the Nazarene as a denomination, uh, because when you join Paznaz, you not only join this local church, but you become a member of the denomination. And so I want you to, I want you to know a little bit about what, who the Nazarenes are and what it means to be a Nazarene. And then I also want to talk about this local church and, uh, and who we are and what membership means for you and means for us here. I want to say just right up front, thank you again for coming to breakfast and giving up a Saturday morning. Uh, there's, we could spend a lot of, a lot of time uh, and probably ought to do three or four in a row, uh, but, but hopefully you'll get enough of your questions answered today to really be able to consider. But this is a low-pressure breakfast. Uh, there will be no hard pitch sell at the end. Um, if you, at the end of this, go, man, that's really wonderful, but I'm not sure I'm ready to just say this is, this is the church I'm ready to commit to that we are totally fine with that. But if you've been here 14 years, let's say, and, uh, <laughs> and you've thought about it and you've prayed about it and, uh, <laughs> and your children have worn out the, you know, it, you know uh, and you're ready to do that, we're ready to, to embrace you as well. So, um, so let me talk to you this morning about uh, four different aspects of, of who we are as a church. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when the denomination was kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be a Nazarene, not just locally, but what does it mean for people to think of themselves as part of the Church of the Nazarene globally. Um, our church is not uh, what's called a confessional tradition. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have confessions or we don't have statements of faith. We certainly do. But there are some traditions, some Christian traditions that started or formed their life around a particular confession. The, the Presbyterian Church is an example of that. They have a particular confession and and what it means to be Presbyterian is to confess that particular uh, confession. We are not that. Um, we're, we are really a, a group of people uh, who, in many ways, formed out of mergers of people who had a common heart and a common uh, vision for especially what it meant to live the holy life. And so as we thought about that, we, because we're not a confessional tradition, uh, the church said, you know, there are really three core values that, that shape our life together. That there are three kind of core values that make Nazarenes Nazarene. And those are that we are, we are Christian, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We're Christian, we're missional, uh, we are participating in God's mission in the world, but we're also a, a holiness people. So we're Christian, missional, and holiness. That those three those three words uh, shape the core values of who we are as a church. And, and we'll come back to those in a minute. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the Church of the Nazarene. Um, this is a gentleman named Phineas F. Brzee, um, who was uh, a Southern Californian like us, uh, in fact, a Pasadenan. Uh, Brzee was a Methodist minister here in Pasadena. And uh, Brzee began to be concerned that the the Methodist Church of his era, the late 1800s, early 1900s, that the Methodist Church, like many churches in this area, were beginning to leave downtown, uh, downtown Los Angeles. That there was a lot of suburban growth in those late 1800s, early 1900s. People were moving increasingly out of the city, finding all of these wonderful places to live, like out here. And as these areas grew, um, a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of people who were broken were being left behind in the inner city not all that different from the situation that we face today. Um, but Brzee and some others got very concerned about that and so thought we, what we really need to do is start a mission and a, a mission to those people and move the church back into downtown. And so the, the first church of the Nazarene was started where Skid Row is today. Um, in fact, there's a couple of people who are great kind of Nazarene historians around here who gave me a, a, a tour of the history of the church, and we started on Skid Row. Um, and Brzee walked through there and knew that there needed to be a mission uh, devoted to, to those folks. And so created this church or this mission, uh, and the name is kind of a fascinating name. You know, uh, I wish some days that we were something like Methodist or Presbyterian or something most people knew about Baptists. You know, there's 4,000 different kinds of Baptists, but when you're on a plane and somebody says, you know, what do you do? And you say, I'm a pastor. And they say, well, what, kind, what church are you part of? I've always wanted to say Baptist, you know, because everybody knows what that is, you know. Uh, but, I, you know, when you say Nazarene, they say, okay. I, one time somebody asked me, but you cut your hair. And I said, 
<clears throat> some of you won't get that joke, which is okay. I said, no, that's the Nazarites. You know, Samson was a Nazarite. He didn't cut his hair, you know. And I said, no, we cut our hair. We're, and we're generally weaklings. Um, but, um, <laughs> but Brzee took this name uh, from the first chapter of John. In fact, I talked about it a few Sundays ago when we were on that text where Jesus comes uh, to Philip and Philip realizes, man, we've met the Messiah. And he goes and gets Nathaniel. And Nathaniel says, well, where does he come from? And Philip says, Nazareth. And Nathaniel responds, can anything good come from Nazareth? Uh, Brzee liked this idea that we would be the church of the Nazarene oriented toward, I mean, we would be centered on Jesus, the Nazarene, but that we would also be a church that was directed towards Nazarenes, towards people that nobody thought anything good could come from them. And so, um, so Brzee uh, began this move uh, into the inner city and, and began to to, uh, to build the church that way. If you are a, a person who loves to kind of read about history, I brought a few copies. I don't have enough for everybody, but if you are a person who loves this kind of stuff, uh, there was a, a new abridged version of, of Brzee's biography that came out about a year ago called Phineas Brzee, Pastor to the People. Um, I actually uh, was asked, I, I wrote the foreword for it, but I have like uh, eight or nine copies, and if you want to steal one today, if you're one of those I was going to say nerdy people, but, but I'll embrace that. If you are a nerdy person like me and you'd love to read some of that, I'd, I'd be glad to give you one of those today. But, uh, but Razi was a very interesting guy. And, uh, and so the church really did start here in Los Angeles. And, and there's some debate about it, but, but Pasadena uh, was, was probably the second church started in the denomination before it was a denomination. Um, if you are... A Pasadena, and you love to go up to Washington Boulevard, uh, you know, up where uh, I like to eat at Burrito Express on the corner of Washington and uh, Sierra Bonita. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but up there, Connell's, uh, you know, Dominico's, and all those great Armenian bakeries up there. Um, up on Washington, there is a Brzee Street up there named after Phineas F. Brzee. Uh, I, I often hear it mispronounced. Uh, I often, people say, I live on Breezy Street, and I always think Phineas just rolled over in his grave right there. But, uh, but Phineas F. Breezy was the, the founder of this church, and in 1895, uh, founded the Church of the Nazarene in Los Angeles, and this is a picture of, of that founding. Uh, Los Angeles First is still in existence. Um, it's in, like us, not its original facility. I think it's in its at least third or fourth facility uh, down in the Rampart District, about Vermont Street. Uh, it's a, a wonderful place, very multicultural still. I think Brzee would love uh, the, the multicultural aspect of what LA First still is. Uh, some of us are, are still very much involved. You'll hear us talk about the Brzee Foundation. Uh, the Brzee Foundation is a, a ministry uh, down in the Rampart District, which is the most crowded piece of property in, in America, uh, that, that district. And uh, but is an after-school, predominantly an after-school ministry, uh, working with disadvantaged youth um, in that area. Also has a health clinic and some other kinds of things, but uh, Brzee would be proud of the way his name is being used in those areas. Um, but in 1908 the, is the official date of the founding of the Church of the Nazarene. Um, as this grew, some other folks around the nation got interested in this, in this movement, and Brzee was connected to several people. Uh, and so in 1908, a whole, ga a whole group of sort of independent uh, holiness groups, a whole, a whole bunch of independent groups met together in Pilot Point, Texas, which is not a great metropolis, by the way. Um, but if you are ever in Dallas and you decide to drive to Oklahoma City and you head up I-35 North, um, as you're heading out of the city on your, on your way, you're almost to North Texas State University. About the time you get to Denton, uh, there's an exit for Pilot Point. If you're not in a hurry, get off there. Just drive over to Pilot Point. Uh, you can't miss it. It's a little town. There's a nice Dairy Queen there and because uh, it's Texas. And, uh, but, but there's a park in the middle of Pilot Point, and, uh, and there's a plaque in the middle of the park that says, this is where the Church of the Nazarene was founded. So, so just go there. Put your hand over your heart. Even if you can't get off the freeway, put your hand over your heart as you pass by the Pilot Point exit. But that's, uh, that's where we were founded in 1908. This is a, a kind of famous picture of that. Um, because we were a tradition that merged a number of groups together, um, that wasn't always an easy conversation because you had groups that came with, with divergent points of view and, and different 
uh, emphases that, that were important to their group. And so it was some interesting negotiations that went on in that tent. And uh, they had to work to find a place of places of unity and peace. And, and so finally, when they got there, uh, they had what they call the Hallelujah March. They took off and marched around the tent singing uh, hymns. And uh, I don't think the, the tent collapsed after the seventh lap, but we, we didn't, we're not sure. Uh, but, but it was wonderful. And, and, uh, and so, so that was where uh, the church got founded in 1908. And since then, there have been several mergers. Uh, in 1898, the Pentecostal Mission of Nashville joined uh, the Pentecostal Church of Scotland in 1906, Layman's Holiness Association of North Dakota, and, you know, Iowa, London, Calvary Holiness Church, uh, and most recently, um, a, an independent group that called themselves the Church of the Nazarene in Nigeria joined in 1988. But that just gives you a sense of those kinds of mergers. Um, I was just on a trip with some pastors and spouses, and the pastor of, of Nashville First Church, which is the really that that Pentecostal mission of Nashville that's it is now Nashville first uh, that was a very interesting negotiation and so um, the reason we got talking about is on the trip I said well you know I, I kind of pastor the second oldest church in the denomination we were formed before the denomination was formed and my friend Kevin who's pastor of Nashville first says I think we're older than you um, that, that Pentecostal mission was before, formed before Pasadena first, but we just didn't join, join the church until 19, you know, the 1898 or whatever. But that, that negotiation was really funny. Um, the leader of that mission in, in Nashville, this is one of my favorite stories to tell, so forgive me, but, um, but when they merged together, it was, it was really intense negotiations. At first, they, they declined because the leader, um, the Church of Nazarene has ordained women from the beginning of our, of our founding, and I'll talk about why that's the case. But, uh, but we've been a tradition that ordained both men and women. But the leader of that national group was opposed to the ordination of women, and that became a major sticking point. So initially, the, that group did not join over that. Uh, my favorite part of that story is when that leader died, his wife pursued ordination in the Church of the Nazarene, which is just <laughs> hilarious. Um, but, but it also kind of fell apart because, um, especially in the early days, the Church of Nazarene had very strong stances against the use of alcohol and tobacco. Now, the predominant reason for that was because um, many, if not most, of our earliest members coming out of downtown Los Angeles and out of that brokenness, most of them are alcoholics and addicted to various you know, substances like tobacco. And so, so part of their freedom, part of their new life in Christ had to do with leaving that behind. Um, but, but what you had in, in Tennessee is you had several people who were part of that mission who were tobacco growers, you know, and you had issues like that going on. And so, so they made a compromise. Brzee said, um, if you could join, if you're, if you are currently smoking, you could continue. But if you hadn't started yet, you couldn't start. It was a grandfather clause. <laughs> it was a grandfather, we grandfathered them in. Uh, but... There were just two or three of those um, kind of negotiations that went on. And, um, and, you know, just through the years in these mergers, there's been some interesting kinds of negotiations as we've merged together. Um, uh, so it all fell apart until that leader died, and then they unanimously voted to join. And uh, so it was very interesting uh, kind of negotiations. But, but today, uh, the Church of Nazarene... Uh, you know, just a little bit over 100 years later, we find ourselves in a, about 156 world areas. Uh, one of my favorite moments each year is uh, when we'll have district assembly or, or we'll have a, a national gathering of the church and or international gathering, and we'll march in all the flags of all of the nations where the Church of the Nazarene currently finds itself. Uh, it's always an emotional moment just to see all of those nations marched in. Uh, but, but it's always really moving to see. Usually the last uh, five or six flags are unmarked. They're, they're white flags, and it doesn't mean we're, we're surrendering. Uh, but it means that, that we are in nations where it's illegal for the church to be. Um, but we have missionaries there uh, serving as teachers, uh, serving in university settings, serving as doctors, um, sort of undercover missionaries, if you will. And so uh, we're not allowed to talk about where they are or publicize where they are. When they come to the States to speak, usually we can't record it or put it on the internet um, because they're serving in some of those uh, some of those sort of uncharted territories, if you will, some of those uh, regions. And so it's, but, but uh, the, 
The church is currently organized in 156 world areas. We have just over 2.2 members uh, in the church now. Uh, interestingly, a few, probably about a decade ago or so, uh, the pendulum swung to, uh, for the first time in our history, we had more uh, Nazarene members outside of North America than inside North America, and that's uh, dramatically the case now. Uh, we have just about 800,000 members in North America, and so 1.4 million members of the Church of Nazarene are, are outside in, in other areas. The church is growing, typical of many evangelical traditions, church is growing fastest in places like Africa and South America. Um, in nations like Brazil, the church is absolutely exploding. The largest church in the denomination is in Campinas, Brazil. Um, and so, and just, and, and in... Um, in places, uh, even in, in the Far East, uh, the church is exploding. And so uh, we have that, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of Christian scholarship today on the shifting of the leadership of the world from, from north to south in Christianity. Um, I think we even see that in Catholicism to some degree. We have an Argentinian pope, right? Um, for the first time in a long time, there's a, a southern hemisphere pope leading the Catholic church. Uh, but that only makes sense because the majority of the members of the Catholic Church come from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and so how we, yeah, and we're, we're kind of in that same shift as well. Uh, we've, we have uh, six general superintendents. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But two of our six also come from the Southern Hemisphere originally. Um, and so we see that, that kind of shifting taking place. But we have 2.2 million members uh, in the church, uh, just over, just short of 17,000 ordained ministers. And if some of you would like to get ordained, we can get to 17,000. Uh, but uh, and we have 687 missionaries. This number actually is declining a bit. Um, uh, an interesting thing that's happening in the world today is uh, we are sending fewer and fewer missionaries from North America to other parts of the world. Um, we're beginning to send more missionaries from other parts of the world to other parts of the world. Uh, in fact, I was with a Korean leader just this week, and we were talking about the number of Korean missionaries that are headed into China these days, um, and the number of people that we are sending from Korea into China. Um, but, but part of that is, uh, as, the, as the church has expanded, many of our missionaries, quote-unquote, or leaders in, in the church, are indigenous, are people who are uh, raised up from those nations and are nationals. And so fewer and fewer Missionaries are going from North America into other parts of the world, uh, but, but that number is held pretty steady at about uh, six to 700 uh, missionaries at any time and uh, active uh, within the church. And uh, the life of missionaries has changed dramatically. You know, the, the way missionaries tended to function was you had young people um, at about 17 or 18 who felt the call to missions, and so they they did a religion degree as an undergraduate or a missions degree and maybe a little bit of seminary degree, and then we sent them, and they were lifetime missionaries. Um, and we have a few of those, by the way, around here. Uh, there's a wonderful place called Casa Robles uh, down in Temple City, which for years has been a retirement center for Nazarene missionaries, that when you retired, one of the things you could do is move to Casa Robles. And it's been really a gift to this church that many of the people who've lived there have then come and become members of this church after they retired. So, I mean, this church has a wonderful missions history, but part of that has to do with we've always had about 12 or 15, you know, 12, 13, 14 retired missionaries around here telling their stories all the time, and uh, it's been wonderful um, part of that. Um, but fewer and fewer people do that kind of mission work. Uh, more and more what we find today are people who do missions as a second career. So in their, about my age, about 40, in their early 50s, decide... And I've had this wonderful career, but I feel like God wants me to go do something for about 10 years. And uh, we have more and more missionaries who go for, I'm going to use quotes here, air quotes, short term, but short terms like five or 10 years. Um, and, and so it's just been interesting the way that missions has, has been changing over the last few decades as the world gets flatter, right? Um, the, the way in which we interact and operate um, has changed quite a bit. So that's a little bit about the, the history of the church. Um, and, uh, and so let me talk to you a little bit about the, about the various uh, core values of who we are. First, we're Christian. So here's the official statement. As members of the Church Universal, we join with all true believers in proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ and in embracing the historic Trinitarian creedal statements of Christian faith. 
we value our Wesleyan holiness heritage and believe it to be a way of understanding the faith that's true to Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. If I, um, if I was better at this particular program um, and knew how to underline things, um, I, would have, I would underline the word A in this statement, uh, about, the, about the latter half of the statement. We value our Wesleyan holiness heritage and believe it to be, and I would underline this word, A way of understanding the faith that's true to Scripture. One, the thing I want you to see in this and the, the, the importance of this core value for us was that we are Christian, and so we share with our brothers and sisters who affirm this, the historic creeds of the church, but we are not an exclusivist tradition, uh, meaning we do not think the Nazarenes have it all figured out. Uh, we do not think we are the only people who get to share in God's eternal life. <laughs> um, it's na- the Nazarene way or no way. You know, uh, we are not that tradition. We are, we are very much an, what's called an ecumenical tradition. Uh, we participate with other denominations in various work. Uh, we celebrate our connection uh, to other brothers and sisters in Christ. We like our Wesleyan holiness heritage. We're proud of that. We're not ashamed of who we are. Uh, we like celebrating that and affirming that and inviting other people into that, uh, but we are not an exclusivist tradition. So I, I, I hope that you will understand that about who we are. Um, you'll pick that up from me, you know, in stories that I'll tell. I'll, you know, sometimes it always sounds like a joke. I'll say, you know, I was in a meeting this week with, with uh, you know, Catholic, Protestant, and, you know, charismatic leaders or something. You know, it always sounds like a, a, a priest, a rabbi, and a pastor walked into a bar kind of thing. But... Uh, but I, I do a lot of work across denominational lines and uh, try to celebrate that. Um, I, was, I was at a lunch this week with uh, some leaders in the African, American, African uh, Methodist Episcopal tradition, the AME church. Um, and, uh, and one of them is the AME pastor here in Pasadena. And uh, I haven't told Scott this yet, but, but after lunch he said, oh man, I love you guys, your other Scott, we do lunch at the, you know, the, pa- the, the uh, pastor's group for Pasadena, and he said, I love your staff, and, you know, and, and I, that was just really encouraging for me. I mean, we, we participate uh, in, the, in the larger work going on here with, in Pasadena with, with denominations, do a lot of work um, in the area of homelessness and uh, just feel like that is what God has called us to do, to be the body of Christ and to find ways of being connected across the body of Christ. So we are not an exclusivist tradition, but we are part of what's called the Wesleyan holiness tradition. Um, I used to teach church, church history, so I can, do, I can do two semesters on this, but let me do, try to do three minutes on it. Uh, for those of you who kind of want to know how this, this goes, and I can give you a chart that sort of maps out the, how the, the family tree of Christianity has developed. Um, but, uh, you know, early on in church history, the church began to divide between East and West. Uh, the Western part of the church, early church, spoke Latin, and the Eastern part spoke Greek. Uh, interestingly, most of the, most of the, the leading places in the early church were those Greek-speaking places, um, Ephesus, um, you know, Constantinople, those kinds of places, there was only one really kind of leading place in the West, and that was Rome. And as the church divided over culture and various issues, and the Western church and the Eastern church got more and more separated, the more Rome was elevated as the key spot in the Western church, and the more the East sort of got divided. Eventually, uh, the Muslim Turks came in and invaded the East uh, regions, and that's where we get that whole history of the Crusades, the Western church coming over, trying to free parts of the Holy Land, and and we get a kind of rugged history between East and West. Finally, in the 11th century, the East and West, West excommunicated each other. Uh, it was a wonderful moment in church history called the Great Schism. Um, it's, it's one of those moments we're really proud of. Um, they, the Pope sent an emissary over from the West to try to uh, bring peace, and it didn't happen. And so he left a papal bull of excommunication on the altar in the great church in Constantinople excommunicating the entire Eastern Church, to which the Eastern Church responded, you can't excommunicate us, we excommunicate you. And so we excommunicated each other. That's beautiful, yeah, beautiful moment. Uh, some one we're really proud of. Um, so one of the things that, that is interesting, that Eastern Church continued to move, move north. And so almost any tradition that you see today that has the word orthodox in it, 
whether that's Russian Orthodox or Coptic Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox or Armenian Orthodox, um, it comes out of that Eastern church tradition. Um, and, you know, every, everybody else, we find our roots in the Roman Catholic tradition in the, out of the West. Uh, one of the things that, and I don't know if you're excited about this or not, one of the things that's really exciting to me these days is that I go to meetings with Catholics and Orthodox and, and Protestants. This is the first time in a thousand years that we've been talking to each other. Um, and there's some interesting conversations that haven't been taking place since the 11th century, since we excommunicated <laughs> each other. Um, and so it's kind of a fascinating time to be a Christian um, today and to see uh, what I think is God's Spirit beginning to ha- invite us to, ha- to find some unity again out of our, our brokenness. But we come out of that Western tradition, um, you know, Luther and the Reformation. Uh, when Luther got excommunicated, <laughs> Luther posted his 95 theses, the things that he was struggling with with medieval Catholicism, and, and the, uh, the Reformation began, and, and all the German princes then decided to convert to Lutheranism, in part out of theology, in part because it meant they could keep the money from the local church in the local setting um, and not have to send their money back to Rome. Uh, but the German princes, uh, you know, started Lutheranism, and the Scandinavian countries took on Luther, uh, Lutheranism. So that's why when you go to Minnesota today, there are so many Lutherans up over there. And, um, and then the, the Reformed tradition, a guy named John Calvin in Switzerland, the Reformed tradition started. So, so if some of you have roots in, in the Baptist tradition or in the, the Reformed church, um, a lot of it finds its roots there. Uh, the Presbyterian Church in Scotland and some other places finds its roots in that Reformed tradition. But in the midst of all that, the, the England was kind of an interesting example. Henry VIII uh, started his own church, started the Church of England, um, in part because he wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't give him one, so he just started his own church. That's convenient. Um, but, but the Church of England became this kind of interesting breed of, of sort of Catholic pra- practices. So if you've ever been to an Anglican church, it feels a little bit Catholic. Um, its theology is very Protestant. Uh, it's, it's centered on the scripture, uh, sola scriptura, which is the scripture alone kind of stuff out of Protestantism. But it even has some Eastern Orthodox theology of Eastern Orthodox believe Jesus became like us so we could become like him, not divine, but so that what it meant to be truly human could be recuperated in us. And a lot of our theology finds its roots out of some of that. Um, and so the Anglican church became this interesting kind of thing But out of that, a guy named John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest, felt like in this movement, if you'll notice, in this Reformation movement, nations converted to various faiths, right? So if the German princes converted to Lutheranism and you were German, guess what you got to be? Lutheran. Congratulations. We're changing all the churches over. We're all now Lutheran. Um, And if you were in England, guess what you got to be? You got to be Anglican. Hey, all right. So... um, so it was still very much national movement. And Wesley felt like, you know, if, if every person in England decided to attend church on a Sunday morning, there would not be enough seats in Anglican cathedrals for everyone to come. And so the, that he felt like the people who were coming were really the wealthy and the poor were getting excluded. And so Wesley began to do some things that don't seem radical to us today, but were really radical in his day. He started preaching in fields. Um, he started setting up tents. He started going to where people were. He started preaching in, in factories. Um, he, he started taking what today are traditional hymns, and so people, you know, uh, folks will fight over it. We want the organ in these hymns. You know, we want the traditional music. But it was very contemporary in <laughs> Wesley's day. He was taking very popular tunes, uh, sometimes even bar tunes, and, set, you know, writing, writing theology to those tunes so that the everyday person could sing these songs. Um, and, and so, you know, the Anglican church was a little nervous about what to do with Wesley. But most importantly, he was really concerned about the spiritual growth in people. And so he started putting them in what we would call today small groups, but he called them bands and classes. And, and so when you became a Christian, he would put you in this small group. And I often will say, you know, most of his groups, you started with the same question, how have you sinned since the last time we got together? which would have been so much more, that would have been such a fun way to start today. In fact, let's go back to the bronze. Bronze, you start us. Steve, how have you sent since the last time we got there? Um, but the point was that, that these various methods of pursuing the holy life would become spiritual disciplines for people. 
But people who were nervous about Wesley kept saying, he is so obsessed with these methods. And it just stuck. He became a Methodist. Right? And so the Methodist tradition was, was born out of Anglicanism. And as it jumped the pond and came to North America, because uh, Wesley lived in the 1700s, about the same time some weird nation was being born um, that, that was trying to embrace religious liberty. And so you had colonies that were sort of set up around religious ideology. So I was just in Boston recently, and you got all these Puritans living in Massachusetts. But then you had these Baptists that they didn't like, so they all moved to Rhode Island and set up a colony there. And you had a bunch of Catholics come over and set Lord Baltimore set up Maryland as a colony. And then you had these really weird people, uh, the Quakers, starting the colony in Pennsylvania, and they loved each other. So the city of brotherly love, uh, Philadelphia, becomes their center, and Pennsylvania becomes the Quaker state. And you, know, you, you have that kind of development, but pretty soon you have religious tolerance and liberty and and the mixture of all of these, and, and so the Methodist tradition came over here, but it still felt, uh, or the Anglican tradition jumped over here, but it still felt a little English, um, and there was a little bit of anti-England thing kind of going on at that time. I don't know if you've watched those movies or read those books, uh, but Methodism in particular took hold in the Southeast, and so even today, if you go, some of the best Methodist universities like Emory and Duke are in places like North Carolina and Georgia. And so the Methodist tradition really began to grow. And it's really out of that Methodist church, then that Wesleyan. But then this holiness tradition was this idea that God wanted us to be holy. And that was the heart of what Wesley was wrestling with. He, that grace wasn't something that just forgave us, but something that transformed us. And so some folks in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, um, the Pentecostal movement came along. Uh, some, and by the way, this also happened in Southern California. I know that we get criticized a lot for being sort of the hotbed of secularism. Uh, you know, we do have Hollywood here, um, and it gets a lot of blame for some of our secularism. Um, but some of the great religious movements have started out of Southern California, not just the Nazarenes. I, th I would put us at the top of the list. But, uh, but the, the Pentecostal movement started at Azusa Street. Uh, about that same time, in the, the early 1900s, uh, people waiting for the Spirit of God to do something new in them and out of that, uh, the Pentecostal tradition began in, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And Pentecostalism has been the fastest growing Christian movement of the 20th century. Um, we are Pentecostals also. The holiness tradition, we started as the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. But we divided with Pentecostals over the issue of speaking in tongues. And the issue was this. The question is, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, what is the sign that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. For Pentecostalism, it usually tends to be some manifestation of the Spirit, like speaking in tongues. For the Church of the Nazarene, the sign that, that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit is that you have a heart renewed in love. Um, it's not that we are opposed to all of those different other signs of the Spirit, but the dividing point became the evidence that one has been filled with the Holy Spirit is not any of those other manifestations of the Spirit. It is, it is simply this, that... that uh, so we would affirm this with Paul. If you speak in the tongues of angels, but you don't have love, you're a clanging gong or clashing cymbal. So that if you get one but not the other, um, you, you don't have the heart of it all. Does that make sense? And so it really, so it's this life of holiness. It's this life of the renewal of the heart and love that became central to us theologically. And so that's a little bit of peace. Does that make sense? So, so if you want to f trace our family tree, start with Jesus, um, and then go from Jesus to Peter. Well, actually, you can go start with Abraham, but that's a long ways back. Abraham, David, and, you know, go from go from Jesus to Paul to uh, to Augustine <laughs> to the Western Church uh, to Roman Catholicism to the Reformation to Anglicanism, Methodism and then the holiness movement out of the 20th century. So we love that tradition, but again, we're not exclusivist tradition. Um, I got lots of good friends in the Reformed Church, and lots of good friends in the Lutheran Church, and lots of good Catholic friends even these days, um, and, and a lot of good friends in the Orthodox traditions as well. Questions about that part of it? That was a really, I, I should, all of that's going to be on the test, by the way. I hope that you... <laughs> Did you get that, Jason? Because I'm not sure I can do that better than that. I can do any, any shorter than that, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Yes, so, oh, thank you. That's such a great question. Yeah, so the, as I said, the, the Church of Nazarene has historically ordained women, but that is because of our roots in the Pentecostal tradition. Um, in Acts chapter 2, uh, when, when Peter preaches his sermon there on the day of Pentecost, um, he quotes from the prophet Joel, who will say, in the last days, uh, it says, you know, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Um, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, the, the Pentecostal tradition has, has said, um, as we see the, the Spirit poured out on people, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that, that women demonstrate the gifts for ministry, the gifts of being Spirit-empowered uh, to be ministers of the gospel. That's, that's not surprising to us. That's, that's a sign that God's Spirit has moving, moved. And so the Pentecostal tradition has tended to say, if, if God's going to in, uh, gift women for ministry, who are we to stand in the way? You know? uh, and we do. We find our roots out of that. Um, so I know that you know, Paul says, I don't want a woman speak in church and those kinds of things. But, but for the church in Nazarene, we would read those things as, as significant cultural issues for Paul as he's addressing the, the issues of, um, you know, it's, first of all, it's fascinating to think that in synagogue, the synagogue life in which Paul was raised, women would not have been allowed in the synagogue. And here we are in the early church. Not only are, not only are women allowed, but they're, making, they're, they're telling stories on their husbands. Um, and they're involved in worship. So that something significant happened in Christ um, that, that means there's now no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so we have some differences there with some of our brothers and sisters. Um, you know, it's interesting at APU, uh, I have, at leading the School of Theology, uh, about 40% of the women in our sem- or people in our seminary or, or in the undergrad program studying theology, about 40% of them are women. Um, but I was teaching a class just uh, Thursday and uh, was talking about pursuing ordination and some of those kinds of things. And a young woman raised her hand and said, I'm not quite sure what to do because I was raised in a tradition that won't ordain me. And, but I really feel called to ministry. What should I do? And so I'm in a place that experiences some of that tension. Um, there's some of our evangelical brothers and sisters who would be opposed to that. But we're not. We and we work hard at it. Uh, about half of our pastoral staff are women, and and uh, and we try to at, we try to say let's let's think about doing that in ways that are non traditional. Also, I mean, it's sort of traditional for a children's minister, early childhood minister, to be a woman. Um, but are there other positions that we can think about where we can celebrate God's uh, calling and leading on us? Um, so that's significant for us. No, there, there are a couple of places in particular. I mean, Paul, Paul, there are a couple of texts in Paul that are problematic where, where Paul will say, I just don't allow a woman to teach men. I don't allow a woman to speak in church. Um, I, can, I, I can do five hours on this. Are you ready? Um, I, was, I was part of a church um, for one year out of my 27 years of ministry, um, going on 28. Uh, one year I was in a non-Nazarene church. And it was very interesting. It was a church that didn't ordain women also. And we were, we were having a service where it was a tenebrae service. It was a, the Friday night of, uh, or no, it was, a, it was a Monday, Thursday service. It was the Thursday night of Holy Week. And we were going to have a service where, where each of the disciples, a representative for each of the disciples, read a text. And we just happened to, it was a fairly large church, and we had 12 guys on staff but two of us were in seminary at the time and had a Thursday night systematics class that our professor wouldn't let us out of, even though it was Monday, Thursday. And so we couldn't be there. And so we needed two people to read. Well, we had some women on staff, but they weren't allowed to be called pastors. And so the, the senior pastor was saying, wow, who can we get to fill in for these other two people? And I happened to be sitting next to one of the women, and I was going, you know, like, you know, she could read. And I'll never forget the pastor looked at me and looked at me in the other direction and said, who can we get? Oh, who can we get? So, so afterwards, we had this interesting discussion. I said, I know that I'm an alien here, okay? I know that I grew up in a tradition that ordains women, but I just, I struggled to know why, why you won't allow at least a woman to even read scripture in church. And, and so he said, well, because the scripture says that, you know, Paul says, I don't allow a woman to speak in church. And I said, yeah, but the same, that same book, says, it's a shame to pray with your head uncovered. 
And you know, I've been here a year now, and you've, I've never seen you pass out prayer shawls at the front door you know, to cover your head. To which the pastor responded, yeah, but that's cultural. And I said, and this isn't? No, this isn't. <laughs> so um, so it's, it's that struggle that we all have to say, as we interpret the scripture and as Paul speaks directly to particular situations, we all have to interpret there what aspects of his teaching there are shaped by the cultural issues and what, what are not. And we're just part of that Christian tradition that says even when Paul is speaking there about women, ultimately the trajectory in which the church was going was for mutuality. And Paul's wrestling with the outgrowth of the beginnings of mutuality. Again, I have brothers and sisters in Christ who would say, that's, that's not cultural. <laughs> like that pastor, he'd say, that's not cultural. Um, and I'd say, okay, but if you're going to be a literalist, let's be a literalist, let's pass out partials. If you didn't hear the question, the question had to do with uh, the issue of homosexuality, which is probably the issue that's going to dominate Christian conversation in some ways for the at least the next decade or so, if not beyond. Uh, we are we are still a tr- tradition that's very conservative with regards to our our view of of marriage and um, and our view of of sexuality. Uh, yes, there are some traditions who. This is the problem that we all have, right? That we all, that we all have to be interpreters of the scripture, and and by the way, there's no way out of that. Um, so, again, my, the professor in me is going to come out here for a minute. But uh, whenever I hear people who will say, "Yeah, I just take I just take the Bible at its word," I always say, "That's such a nice thing to say, but you haven't read Leviticus in forever." You know, I mean, you you and and again, you haven't you haven't prayed with your head covered, even if you want to get to the New Testament and various places there. We're all interpreters of the scripture. And there are, there are traditions around who are saying um, the issues around marriage, the issues around sexuality are also cultural. Uh, we're a tradition who would say we're, we're not convinced that that's the case, that that part of how we've been created, male and female, are for covenantal relationships that open themselves up for the possibility of new life to come out of them. And, and we're a tradition that's very, still very committed to that, and uh, thankfully so. But, um, but I know that that's, you know, that is the hot-button issue um, around culture um, and around the church and between denominations these days. But we're, we're a very conservative denomination with regards to sexuality. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks for that question. Um, so that's more than you needed, uh, but we have a shared statement of belief in our manual. Uh, so this is, this is our manual. Uh, this is 2009 to 2013. The new one hasn't come out yet, or if it has, I haven't bought one yet. Uh, every four years we get together and we uh, work on not only our statements of faith, but we work on who we are as a tradition. Um, but in that, there is a shared statement of faith. Uh, So if you, on your table, you have these uh, articles of faith books. Uh, We have 14 articles of faith, uh, and and that's yours to have. Uh, But let let me share with you, as you read that and as you wrestle with that, if you have questions, you are always welcome to email me. I am never happier than when I'm uh, talking theology. Uh, But but I want you to know this. You do... You do not have to affirm every part of the 14 articles of faith to be a a Nazarene. Uh, We have a shared statement of faith, and here it is. So this is where you should lean in. Recognizing that the right and privilege of persons to church membership rests upon the fact that they're being regenerate, we would require only such avowals of belief as are essential to Christian experience. We therefore deem belief in the following statements to be sufficient. So here it is. Oh, let me go back for just a second. I want you to know this part of that. Recognizing that the right and privilege of persons to church membership rests upon, because I'm not sure you use regenerate every day in your, in your uh, vocabulary, upon the fact of their being regenerate. Um, that's a word that means that you're being made new, that, you're, that, that membership depends upon the new birth in us. So we're very much, in some ways, a kind of experiential tradition that says what really binds us together is we're all new creatures. We are all new creations. We're people who've experienced the new life in Christ. That's the heart of it. You know? Everything else is sort of secondary to that. 
So because membership requires that, then we only require such avowals, another word we don't use every day, such avowals of belief as are essential to Christian experience. So here's our statement of faith. We believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so we are a Trinitarian tradition. Um, believe that God is three in one, and one in three, and three in one, and one, yes, that he's Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in the Old and New Testament scriptures given by plenary, again, not a word you use every day, but plenary means full, um, by the full inspiration containing all truth necessary to faith and Christian living. We believe that humankind or man is born with a fallen nature and is therefore inclined to evil that continually. We believe that the finally impenitent are hopelessly and eternally lost. We believe that atonement through Jesus Christ is for the whole human race and that whosoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is justified and regenerated and saved from the dominion of sin. We believe that believers are to be sanctified wholly subsequent to regeneration through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, in other words, these two statements say we believe Grace is there to forgive us, but we also believe that grace is there to change us. Um, and that's a very important part of who we are. That's a simplified way of saying those two things. We believe that the Holy Spirit bears witness to the new birth and also to the entire sanctification of believers. Bless you. And we believe that our Lord will return, the dead will be raised, and final judgment will take place. Okay? So, I don't know... In some ways, we could have just gone ahead and affirmed the Apostles' Creed because this is not much of, of an expansion of the Apostles' Creed. But that is our shared statement of faith. So if you want to know, what do I have to believe to be a member? That's it. Right? That's it. And you'll notice there's some space there for us to have some differences of opinion on a few things. Um, but that's, that's our shared statement of faith. The 14 articles will tell you a little bit more about who we, who we are and the kinds of faith that shapes us. But again, this is the requirement for membership, uh, affirmation of these kinds of statements of faith. Yes, ma'am. We believe that finally impenitent are hopelessly and eternally lost. Yeah. Um, by the way, you'll, you'll notice there's openness in that statement for some variances of opinion on what that means. Uh, but uh, we believe that eternal life, I would say it this way, that eternal life is dependent upon our commitment and relationship to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that whatever not eternal life looks like, you don't want it. Make sense? Is that helpful? You'll notice, by the way, we use kind of generic language with regards to eternal life. None of us knows what heaven looks like, right? None of us knows what heaven looks like. And uh, we're all going to be surprised. I love the theologian who says, we, we know no more about the life to come than the, than the the unborn child knows about the life they're about to experience. For nine months, they've heard rumblings and sounds, and, uh, but they have no, that's all they know about what they're about to experience. And that theologian says, we too, we're like the unborn child. We have rumblings and hints about what eternal life is going to look like, but, but it's far more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. I would say the same thing about, about judgment. We, we have little or no idea about what, what something like hell would look like, what, what judgment would look like. And, and so I always want to be careful about saying more than I know about those things. But I know this, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we want that both in the tomorrow and in the today. And I, and I believe to live apart from Christ today is hell and to live apart from Christ forever is hell, <laughs> is brokenness, is lostness, is, um, you don't want to be lost now or forever. Does that make sense? I, yes. So, it's away from God. Yeah, I don't want to be away from God now or, now or then. So, does that help you? Did I answer you? Okay. Any other questions on that? You guys are really good. Um, you doing okay? All right. So, I think then we have a big tent, um, I, I oftentimes say to people that you got to get comfortable with the Nazarenes that we kind of have a, a big tent. And what I mean by that is there's a statement that gets credited to John Wesley, although it wasn't original with him. But it's in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, charity. Um, it's a wonderful statement, and I think it expresses the sort of vibe of who we are. Um, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem because what's essential for us may not be essential to somebody else and what's essential to them. And we still get to fight about what's essential or not. 
Um, but I'll just give you, I'll give you a couple of examples because I think it's important. Um, I, I just want you to understand who we are so that we don't make you frustrated down the road. Um, we are not a tradition, for example, that specifies a particular understanding of creation. I don't know why the beginning and the end of the Bible is always so hard for us, but it is. Um, we are a tradition, our statement on creation is one sentence long. We believe that God created. And we affirm any scientific theory that basically includes God. That's my paraphrase of it. Um, however, we are a big tent tradition. So, in fact, uh, there was a conference that just went out on Point Loma this weekend, or this last week, um, over issues of or human origins. And you had all these Nazarene people there, some who were young earth creationists. Um, I have a friend who's convinced that he knows the first day of creation was October the 23rd, 4004 BC. And he has the charts to show. Um, so this, was an, this will be an anniversary year for us. Uh, but... Uh, But some of my friends who are at this conference are really good Nazarene folks teaching some of our schools who are scientists who are, con who are committed to some form of theistic evolution, that they see patterns of evolution in and believe in the very old earth, uh, but are convinced that God's both at the beginning of that, but participating in the process of that. And then we got all sorts of folks in between. So here's what I need you to know. You can be a young earth creationist. We're not going to kick you out over that. But you can also be a theistic evolutionist. We're not going to kick you out over that. So, you, so we can't kick each other out over those issues. We have a big tent. As long as we affirm God as the creator, we're a tradition that allows for us to arm wrestle over the how. Um, and sometimes that's really problematic for some people because being a, a particular one or the other is essential. But for us, it's not. That's a non-essential. What's essential is that God created. What's uh, I have to say to people, it's the who and the why that's essential for us. The when and the how, we'll arm wrestle over. Um, same thing for the end. <laughs> I don't know why the end is such a hard thing for us. Um, but, you know, you have these traditions like premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. I joke that I'm a panmillennialist. I think it's going to pan out in the end, you know, kind of thing. Um, but, um, but there are some Christian traditions where you could not be a pastor in that tradition or a member in that tradition without affirming some premillennialist position that, that the return of Christ will happen and then there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ, etc. Um, there are some Christian traditions in which you have to be a postmillennialist, that there will be this thousand-year reign and Christ will come at the end. Um, we are a tradition where truly you can be either of those, any of those. We, our statement on the return of Christ is, we believe Christ will return and renew all things. Woohoo! Uh, so there you go. Um, so I don't think it's because we're a wimp on those issues. It's just we consider the essential to be the affirmation of the return of Christ, but we see, consider the, the particulars to be non-essentials. And so we're somewhat broad there. And I just want you to be comfortable with that because when you come to me and you say, Pastor, I was in my Sunday school class and there are post-millennials in there. And the Bible specifically says, you know, this, this, and this. I'll say, God bless you. I'm so glad that you're committed to that position. But we are not. <laughs> we're, you know, we are, we're broad. And, and that can be your agenda if you want. But you'll be frustrated because it, it, it can't be mine. Um, it, we're, we're not in the business of kicking out people with various views on that. Um, so I just got done preaching through Revelation. And a lot of people loved it. And a couple of people didn't. Um, but God bless us. We all get to be in the tent. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of that thing. Yeah. No, the articles of faith have, I mean, they've changed some, but not, not in great detail. You'd be surprised. It's very hard for our articles of faith to be changed. Um, it takes not only a vote of the General Assembly, but then it takes a vote of all of the district assemblies to affirm that. I mean, it's, it's quite a long process to change our articles of faith. Some have changed. Some of the other parts of the manual are a little easier to change. Some of our rules about Christian living and those kinds of things um, can change a bit. You know, how does this get lived out is really a challenge, especially when you're a global church, because things that are significant to North Americans don't seem to be very, very important to some other traditions or some other nations and some other cultures. So how we deal with that, um, you know, yeah. So for some of you who grew up in the church in Nazarene, we didn't, you know, the old joke is we didn't drink, dance, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. That, um, that 
uh, we, had, we had some really specific things to say about dancing, for example, for a long time in the manual, because it seemed to be a, a kind of worldly practice in North America, where, you know, when I, when I go to the Hollywood Bowl in the summer, I love to go to the Hollywood Bowl, um, I always drive Hollywood Boulevard home, in part from sheer fascination to see all of the people on Hollywood Boulevard. But Debbie and I always, and we have the same conversation every time because our kids are about that age, right? Of these young people who are standing outside clubs, um, scantily dressed, and, we're, and we drive down the street so we can say, oh, I can't, her mother can't know she's wearing that, right? I mean, so we have those conversations like, oh, that breaks our heart, you know? Um, but all these kids lined up outside clubs. Nazarenes are people who say, man, whatever's going on in there is not holy, <laughs> you know, is not helpful to anybody's spiritual life. And so we, we should avoid those kinds of practices. But, you know, some other world cultures, dance means something very different to them than it means to us and has very different cultural implications than it, than it has to what goes on on Hollywood Boulevard on a Friday night. You know? and, and in some ways, we've even had to wrestle with, you know, when I go to weddings and, we, and there's, there's a father and daughter who dance at the end of that wedding. That has a very different kind of cultural implications than what's going on there. <laughs> and what's going on. Yeah, so, so some of those kinds of things we've moved and pushed around about, and every four years we seem to want to fight about some of those other things again or argue about those things again, some of those kinds of things. Um, but the articles of faith haven't changed a whole lot. I mean, we've been a broad tradition. Um, even on these issues like creation, one of the opening... One of the, open, the, the presidential address at the opening of what's now pa Point Loma College, what used to be Pasadena College, the president talked about the need for a Christian university that was open to these issues in science. I mean, this is in the you know, 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, we were already beginning to say, we can't just stick our head in the sand and say, no matter what scientists say, we're not going to, we're going to ignore that. Um, and so some of these areas, we we may have been, you know, again, we're a broad tradition, so you may meet some Nazarenes who are less funky than me, <laughs> or, less, uh, or who will say, this is my view, um, but as a tradition, we're not. Okay, questions? You good? All right, and we have so many other things to get to. Um, we're holiness. Here's our statement. God who is holy calls us to the life of holiness. We believe that the Holy Spirit in, seeks to do in us a second work of grace called by various terms, including entire sanctification, baptism with the Holy Spirit, cleansing us from all sin, renewing us in the image of God, empowering us to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves, and producing in us the character of Christ. This is the key line. Holiness in the life of believers is most clearly understood as Christ-likeness. Uh, I, I've said this a couple of times, but if you'll get this, I think you'll get the heart of what we are affirming on this. That for us, the grace of God is not just to pardon us. So there are some Christian traditions who I think at their heart would say, every day we just sin in word, thought, and deed. And all God can kind of do is overlook our sinfulness. And so right now we will just, we'll just do our best, but... Thankfully, God's grace has forgiven us and continues to forgive us, and, and we kind of live into that. We are a tradition that says we're just not convinced of that. We're convinced that God wants to forgive us, but we're also convinced that God wants to change us and that God wants to make us a new creation and wants to purify our hearts and continue to shape us. That doesn't mean um, we live out these kinds of lives of perfection, but it means that we are, we are made whole and we begin to, to live into that wholeness and we continue to be shaped into that life of holiness um, as God continues to, to form us. The image I often use is, uh, this year will be, uh, Debbie and I will celebrate 24 years this month of being married, or yeah, 24 years in February. February the 23rd, 1990, we stood up in front of a bunch of people, many of whom brought gifts, um, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, because we didn't have anything. Uh, and we said, I do. And I'm going to stick with this woman. And I'll never forget, when we walked out of the church, we were married. I mean, we were married. I remember waking up about seven weeks later, and she was still asleep and looking across the bed and thinking, oh my word, I am married. Like, super married. Like, we are really healthy. We could be in this a long time. We are married. So in one sense, I could not have been more married than I was when we left that service. But can I... 
just testify since she's not here today, 24 years later, I am so much more married than I was then, you know, that, 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 and in some ways, that's the way we think about the holy life, that at some point we surrender ourselves completely to Christ, and we could not be more sanctified, complete, we could not be more His than in that moment. Um, but can I also testify that you know, years and years later, each day I find that God does more and more in shaping me to be what he's calling me to be. Um, and the maturity of faith continues to be at work in us. And so that, that's an important aspect for us, is this life that, that God has called us to be holy as he is holy. My, my line here, by the way, is I, just say, I say, in the church of Nazarene, you can never say, well, that's just old, and you fill in the blank. So you can never say, well, that's just old John. You know, if you knew John, you, if you knew everything John had been through, you know why we have to, and John's a great guy, but you know have to, why we have to put up with John, you know. Um, in the Church of Nazarene, we can never say that because old John can always be the new John that God has, wants him to be. And so we, we never just get to say, well, we're just stuck being broken. We're just stuck being trapped. We're just stuck being sinful. Um, this is, by the way, also what gives us the optimism of grace, like Brzee had to say, so then we can go into dark places to people who, are, who nobody thinks anything can good, good can come from them. Because God can take this broken person and make them a new person out of it. They're, they're somewhat mutual words. Uh, regeneration is the new birth. So a couple weeks ago when I was preaching out of that great John 3 text where Nicodemus is asking about the new birth, we would think about regeneration as everything that had been broken, that there is a newness that comes out of that. There's a regeneration. Sanctification is kind of a cool word in the idea that, that everything that we have then becomes, belongs to God. Things that are sanctified are set apart for God's purposes in the world. So, um, so when the temple is set up and you have all these utensils, they're all made holy, right? They go through all these rituals to make the cups and the plates and the altar and all of that. They want to sanctify all of that so that they can be used for God's purposes. I would say the reason we have to have regeneration happen in us is because uh, God wants to use Jennifer for special purposes in the world. But in order to use her, to use her in those kinds of ways, she has to become the kind of person God can use in that. She has to be set apart, sanctified for his purposes. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we're missional. Uh, so we're a sent people responding to the call of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go into all the world, witnessing to the Lordship of Christ, participating with God in the building of his church and the extension of his kingdom. You will hear us talk about missions a lot around here. Uh, our mission begins in worship. So each week we're gathered together uh, we sense that God has called us to come and to worship him, to be his unique people in the world. Um, we have, you know, just over 26,000 churches worldwide. I think it's, uh, that's an old number, so it's probably close to 28,000 now. Um, we, we live out our mission in evangelism and compassion. This is a picture of a church that we built in Peru just a few years ago. You can see my head sticking up back there and my dad over on the far right. Uh, these are the Garmans, uh, uh, Larry and Addie Garman, missionaries to Peru, now live here at uh, Casa Robles. Um, but we will, you know, you'll hear us talk about at least two trips a year uh, somewhere uh, to experience God's uh, mission and compassion. Uh, we want you to get connected in discipleship. Uh, week to week, our mission is to continue to grow, to be all that God wants us to be. Uh, we're deeply devoted to education. Uh, we have schools all around uh, the world. Uh, this is a picture of graduation at Nazarene Theological College in Manchester, England. Uh, the last several years, we've sent the team to NTC uh, to do some work there. Um, it's our one school that offers PhDs, and so it's a place where a lot of our people from around the world come to get educated and finish a PhD so we can send them into the world. Um, it's kind of a unique college connected to the University of Manchester, so when you get a degree there, you're really getting a degree from the University of Manchester as well, uh, but a wonderful place. We have five seminaries, 32 Bible colleges, 13 liberal arts colleges and universities, uh, three nurses training colleges, one education college. 
in 2010, so it's probably over 50,000 now, but we, had, we have just about 50,000 students every year in the Nazarene school of one kind or another. Um, so that's our mission. Christian or holiness, we're missional, right? Christian holiness, missional. That's a bit about the church of the Nazarene. So here's my, here's my script. Um, it, here's my script when I get asked that question. I'll say, have you heard of the Methodist Church? And they'll say, oh, yeah. And I'll say, well, we're an offshoot of Methodism. We're, uh, we're about 100 years old, uh, but we're a tradition who started because, um, like a lot of churches, I've given you my script already today, like a lot of churches, we started abandoning the inner city. And so we started with a heart that said, uh, we believe God really wants to change people's lives, and that that brokenness that I don't know if I'd use the word sin on a plane, but uh, I'd say you know that our, that our brokenness um, doesn't have to be the last word. And so we've been a, that's kind of who we've been as a tradition. And and now um, I said we're not that old; we're only a hundred years old. But we've got about we've got a little over two million members around the world. But we're very sim- I always say we're very similar to Methodists or. I will say, have you ever heard of a free Methodist? And they'll say, yeah. I'll say, well, we're, we're like kissing cousins to the free Methodists. Uh, we're almost identical in theology to the free Methodists or the Wesleyans. Um, but if people, you know, oftentimes, you know, in the world today, where fewer and fewer people have a kind of Christian background, I'll be often asked, I'll say, I'm a Nazarene. And they'll say, is that Christian? And I'll say, oh, yeah, that's Christian. And then I'll say, how long you got? I can give you a church history. I can give you my lecture on church history. But uh, yes, I'll say, yeah, we're Christian. Um, we're part of the, Pro- we're a Protestant church. Um, and we are, and yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find that, that my line that where I say, you know, we're really who we are. We're just, a, we are a people who are convinced God doesn't just want to forgive us, but but transform us. People go, oh, okay, yeah, that totally, totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And you're free to use my John sermon on Nathaniel also. That works a lot. Nathaniel didn't think anything good could come from Nazareth. And we're not, we are not a predestination tradition um, so that uh, so that the, we are part of, Wesley and the Anglican Church was part of what's called an Arminian tradition, not Armenian, um, Ar- Armenian with an I instead of an E. Um, uh, James Arminius at, in the Reformation was a Dutch uh, pastor who said, who believed that God's grace is extended to everyone, and then in God's grace that's extended to everyone gave everyone the opportunity to respond to that grace. Um, Calvin and some of the Reformed tradition, Luther, Calvin, tended to believe much more in, in what's called predestination, that God selects people for salvation. And part of that was a response to Catholicism, medieval Catholicism, where it increasingly felt like if you wanted to be saved, it was because you worked yourself into salvation. And so Luther and Calvin want to say, it is grace alone that saves us, and therefore that grace must be something that God gives to us um, and gives to us uh, in ways that we can't reject. Wesley believed in what's called responsible grace, and sometimes I'll, I'll write it out, response-able, that God extends his grace to everyone and makes it possible for us to respond, but it's up to us to respond. That's, so there is some differences there. I will say this, I've never met a hardline, even a hardline reformer who acts like that in missions, so, like, when we go into the mission field, we're convinced God has already extended his grace to everyone, and so we're inviting people to respond to the grace that God has already given them. A hardline predestination person goes in the mission field thinking, God's already only selected, you know, somebody may be the elect and somebody may not be the elect. Um, I've never met a reformer who actually lives like that. Uh, they go into the world assuming we don't know who the elect are, and therefore inviting people to respond to God's election or predestination and selection in their life. Um, but we're, we're not that kind of people. And, and so we tend even to say, 
um, not just with regards to salvation, but even in our interaction in life, that there's a kind of synergy between divine and human action. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't blame the mess that I've made out of my life solely on, on God. You know, I, I have a friend who really has messed up their life and uh, recently was we were reflecting on the mess that they've made out of their life. They said, well, I know that, I know that God had a plan in doing all these kinds of things and you know, my, my unfaithfulness to my spouse and which led to a divorce and my loss of job. I know that God has a plan in all this. And I said, I'm not sure that any of this was part of God's plan. I think you've got some major responsibility to take on here in terms of, I think you've made a mess out of your life. Now, the good news of the gospel is God's able to take the mess and bring good out of it. I certainly don't think the, the falling apart of your family was something God preordained from the from the foundations of the earth, um, and this is his preset purposes. I think maybe you ought to take a little responsibility here for that. God's like, hey, don't look at me. You know, I, that wasn't my plan. You know, I didn't, that was not my plan for you. Um, but, but the good news in that is God keeps working. The story I love to use there is... First Samuel 8, when Israel comes and demands a king, God says, this is a terrible idea. You shouldn't have a king, but Israel has one anyway. What I love about God is God works with them. And God, if you're going to have a king, we might as well have one after my own heart. And so Saul's kind of a weasel, but let's go find David. And so I love that this is not what God wanted for Israel, and yet God doesn't abandon them in that. And so sometimes I will talk about that with people, that that's how we see God. God constantly keeps interacting with us, but but he also gives us free will to accept or deny him, to, to live into his wisdom or to reject that, to live according to his purposes or walk away from that. Um, so I don't know if that helps. but. Uh.